it is a beautiful morning here in western Colorado headed through to Beck Canyon got the Colorado River there on our right so welcome back everybody David Shepard here on the humble hotshot channel and today we're headed out to do another car haul this morning we've got the our loner bumper pull PJ trailer back there and actually headed to pick up another Toyota Land Cruiser this one's a 1974 I believe FJ 40 so kind of the old Jeep style looking Land Cruisers that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And we're picking up from a private residence and bringing it to a restoration company here in Western Colorado. So another direct customer for us, which is awesome. Praise God for that. And I will show you guys the vehicle. I will show you guys the trip along the way, go over some DOT regulations with you guys today, all right after a quick word of scripture. So today I'm going to share Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45. This is Jesus speaking during his Sermon on the Mount, and he says, I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he sends, or excuse me, he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So, a really difficult command here. I struggle with it myself, but really an excellent call to, instead of retaliating and seeking revenge from those who might harm you, instead we're to pray for those, pray for their good, pray for them to change for good. And, and it says, then we'll be children of our Father in heaven because he sends sun and rain and gives life and breath even to evil people and, and those who hate God. God does not wish that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So if we're really loving our neighbor, loving our fellow man, even if they do us harm, we shouldn't retaliate. We shouldn't do the old eye for an eye, but instead we should pray for their repentance and that they would change for good. And really that will make the world a better place rather than repaying evil for evil as, as you know, our human hearts really desire to do at times. So thanks for listening to that guys just about out of the canyon now hope you guys enjoyed the view and i'm going to catch back up with you uh when we get to our pickup like i said i'll show you the vehicle and i'm going to go over um kind of what's required i get this question quite a bit what's required to display as far as dot numbers and um mc numbers and all that stuff so i'm going to show you guys what's required with that and catch back up with you soon All right, we've got the Toyota FJ40 Land Cruiser loaded up. I've shown you guys how to strap down vehicles plenty of times in the past, but there are a couple unique things I've noticed with older vehicles. So a couple tips, just things to watch out for. And then as I promised, I'm gonna show you guys what's required as far as displaying numbers for commercial vehicles. So you can see I've got the truck magnets on with a little bit of privacy tape. And as I've mentioned, well, maybe not in videos, but in the comments, some people have asked, where are my DOT numbers? So these are magnets, obviously removable, and I do always remove them for the videos. Some other hotshot YouTubers have actually had issues. Unfortunately, there's people out there that'll, I guess, see a number on a video and start running trucks, trailers under that DOT number. So obviously that's, that's not gonna last long. You'll be found out pretty quickly. Um, but not something I ever want to deal with. So I always remove the magnets for the videos, but since this question has come up, what is required to display as far as numbers? I'm gonna get into that in just a minute. And uh, first I'll show you guys a little closer look at this actually really nice condition, uh, 1974 Toyota FJ40, as I said. And it is going to a restoration shop here in Western Colorado. Um, but just kind of for a mechanical freshen up, it's going to get disc brakes and kind of some modern upgrades, which is cool, but really good condition overall. This is actually an aluminum tub, aftermarket aluminum tub that was put on there in the 80s and uh, really nice little rig. Starts up good, runs good. I drove it up onto the trailer and um, a couple things I did notice with these older vehicles. Number one. There's no wheel lock. You can see the tires are not perfectly straight like I usually get them, not that it really matters. But when I started strapping down, I think I did the other side first, but when I started pulling the strap tight, the tire was moving a lot more than it typically would. And I realized, ah, older vehicle doesn't have a steering wheel lock like the new ones would. So 
obviously there's ways to get around that just pull one side kind of snug go back to the other side um, or have someone hold the wheel if you got an extra set of hands but not that it really matters but something to consider and then also when loading this I since it is an older vehicle I asked the owner does the e-brake work and his response was uh yeah so I took that as not to be trusted not that you ever uh, rely solely on an emergency brake parking brake anyway but you know when I drove it up the ramps and got it initially on the trailer it's nice to just leave it running set the brake hop out and then kind of see where where your weight's sitting, how the back of the truck looks, and then finalize the position. But since that e-brake was not to be trusted, I went ahead, shut the vehicle off, had it in gear, so it's not going anywhere. Um, and with that said, this one is four-wheel drive, of course, so it's in four-wheel drive, low range, a little bit better getting up the steep ramps, and also leaving the transfer case in low range, and the transmission in, I think it's in first gear right now, just less chance of that vehicle going anywhere. First or reverse would be your lowest gears. Um, aside from that, pretty straightforward. I've got it strapped through the wheels like I do. I've actually heard some people say that you don't want to strap through a steel wheel, that this could cut the straps. But these particular lasso straps have the chafe protector here. And I've never ever had an issue. I've done it many times like this. Um, I always prefer to go through the wheel rather than around the entire tire. Um, to me, that's that has a greater likelihood of moving around with all the tire squish on both sidewalls. And then also, you know, once the strap's tight, this shouldn't happen, but also just the opportunity for that strap to slip off. There's no true, uh, true mechanical, there's, you know, this is going through a hole where it can never come out of here. Whereas around a tire, it could slip and loosen up, especially if this tire moves back and forth a little bit. So I prefer to go through the wheel, done it like that many times. And I've never, ever seen, you know, even a mark of where it's wanting to cut through a strap or chafe. You know, if there's no movement, there shouldn't be any chafing. And again, these have these guards. So I always just make sure that's going through the contact point. So to each their own, this is how I do it. I've had good success with that, and so I am comfortable with it. A little bit weird the way the straps lined out this time. Um, you know, we've got a stake pocket here and another one here. So this isn't the best angle. So we actually just alternated the long strap on the front, keep arresting forward motion, and then we use the opposite stake pocket for the long run to be in the back. Just so everything's secure, you know, two forward, two back, as always. And Really, I know I've mentioned this before, but the big thing is to arrest that forward motion with vehicles or really with any type of freight because you're not going to accelerate the truck and trailer out from under this rig. But if you have to make a panic stop, even just catch a red light at the wrong time and have to really clamp down on those brakes, you want to make sure your load's not coming forward. So aside from that, typical car haul. We've been over this plenty of times before and uh, praise God, everything's going smoothly. One thing to note, we did recently switch to these aftermarket Valcrum uh, oil bath caps. These are oil bath axles on this one. And really nice units. They replace the factory plastic ones with this nice aluminum. It gives you a drain plug for servicing the oil bath. And then your vent cap, of course, as well. It's also nice because it has a fluid line, oil level line on there. However, did notice after I installed these we were having leaks with them so when I first put them on I didn't go too crazy tight because like I said these are aluminum threads going into a steel hub and I'm always just nervous about dissimilar metals and stripping out that soft aluminum so I went back around snugged each of them up and that did cure three out of four however you can see the oil sling on this wheel and actually a little seepage even and I'm just not sure where it's coming from. I snugged this one just like the other three. So perhaps this drain plug, the Allen bolt there, needs some thread sealant. But it actually looks like it's coming out from around this cap. So still plenty of oil in there. I've been checking all the oil levels as well as the hub temperatures like I always do. Um, so I don't know. Something to note. I guess the verdict, the jury's still out on the Valcrum caps. I think they look cool. They look nice on the red trailer. But uh, yeah, I'll keep you guys posted on that and uh, see how those hold up. But big topic today, like I said, 
is the DOT and MC number. So once again, you can see my magnets here and what is required for commercial hauling. So unfortunately, this is one of those rules that does vary state by state and each state kind of requires something a little bit different. But according to my research from the FMCSA, the bare minimum is company name. You can see I've got up top DOT number and then MC number is actually optional, but I've heard some states do want to see that. Um, if you're interstate only, obviously you won't have an MC number, so you'll just have still US DOT, but with your state at the end. So for me, it'd be CO for Colorado, but we're talking interstate. So you got company name, DOT number, MC number, questionable. So I went ahead and put it on the magnets and then also not required for every state, but I know it's several states that want to see either city and state of origin or a phone number where obviously your area code will show where you're from. So as far as I see it, correct me if I'm wrong or if you've had other research, the bare, bare minimums will be company name and DOT number and then MC number and city of origin or zip code as well. So you may see more numbers than that, especially on big rigs. They like to put their GVW on there. That's something that's just helpful when you're going through the way stations. Also, on the passenger side, it's a good thing to have the last eight. I don't have it personally, but it's a good thing to have the last eight digits of your VIN number. Just on the passenger side, that way when you go through the scale house, they could see your VIN from inside, and those last eight digits will reveal your full truck GVW and um, also in some cases, I believe your axle rating. So it might just keep you from getting pulled in to the scale house. They'll see that going by, they'll see your weights obviously, and they'll be like, okay, you're not exceeding your drive axle limit, you're not exceeding your uh, total GVW for the truck. And so that might just be helpful, but as far as I know, it's not required. And then again, certain states require other things, especially once you get into the CDL and even like over 80,000 pounds require more, but um, New York is one that requires an HUT, heavy use tax number. If you're running in New York, I believe over 26,000 or 20, yeah, 26,000 one pound or more. Um, Kentucky is also the same. I think it's a higher weight threshold, but you need a K KYU number. And then New Mexico is another one. Again, where if you're at those CDL weights, you need a permit number specific to Kentucky. So. That's some of the other numbers you might see, but once again, this is sort of the bare minimum. I hope that answers questions. And again, I do like to use the magnets. They're easy to take on and off. And um, it's just nice that, you know, when I wanna use the truck, obviously I use this truck for personal use in my off time. And it's nice to just be able to peel them off, stow them away on a flat surface. And that's that. Um, couple other things with displaying your numbers. They do have to be contrasting colors, it says right in the FMCSA rules. So you can't do the ghost graphics with black on black or you know white lettering on a bright silver truck or anything like that. And then also the lettering is supposed to be a minimum of... All right, we're back in the truck as you can tell. Sorry that last clip got cut off because the dang camera overheated and shut itself off. So I apologize for that, but I mentioned the contrasting colors and the last thing I want to mention about displaying DOT MC numbers all that is that the lettering does have to be an inch and a half tall inch and a half in size I know I've seen it smaller on other trucks but again I don't know if any DOT officer is gonna get too nitpicky about that stuff but there you have it those are the regulations I hope that helps clear some things up and answer those questions for you guys and Aside from that, um, like I said, I do like using the magnets since they're removable. I can put them in different places and I do like to alternate. Sometimes I put them on the rear door on each side and sometimes I put them on the bedside. And that's one thing I will mention with using magnets, especially if you're in the rust belt or something like that, or just an area with a lot of moisture, you're gonna wanna take those off and moisture will collect between the truck body and that magnet and they it can cause rust and paint bubbling and all that stuff if you don't stay on top of it so make sure you peel those off let it dry out behind there and i've also found that just a good coat of wax on the truck or at least where you're going to stick the magnets 
will help anything from from penetrating the paint layer and make them come on and off real nice and clean like that so sorry about the last clip getting cut off we're out in the desert here as you can see uh oh bump coming up colorado roads what else is new but it's super hot out here oh that is a pretty good dip hang on all right looking good truck's reading uh yeah 92 degrees so it's hot out here we're uh, kind of in the high desert of the western slope of Colorado, so kind of taking it slow. Speed limit's 75, but I don't tow too much over 80, especially when it's this hot. Keep the tires a little cooler, and um, praise God, everything's going well. You can see the FJ back there, staying put, even through all these bumps. Wow, this road's a little more tore up than I remember, but... Once again, I hope that answers those questions for you guys. Put in the comments below if there's other just information you're looking to learn, and I will do my best to answer. I don't claim to be, boy, more bumps. <laughs> I don't claim to be an expert on this stuff. I've done my own research, and that is something worth mentioning that, you know, it'd be great if all these DOT regulations were completely cut and dry and uniform across the board in all 50 states but that's just not the case you have to do your own research which includes a lot of reading and then it's also the interpretation of those laws and officers are given discretion so their interpretation might be a little bit different so um, like I said just keep that in mind do your own research always double check and um, praise God hope that answers those questions Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Give this video a thumbs up and you got to hit that little bell to know when I'm putting up new ones. So thanks guys. God bless each and every one of you. I'll be praying for you and I hope that you will at least try, strive to pray for those who persecute you and, and make an attempt to love your enemies. And I think you'll be, I think you'll be surprised at the positive impact it might have on your life as well as those around you. So God bless. Take care. We'll see you on the next one.